surgery. He stays in town with, I think, Jenny, his son Jenny that night, and um, Kay is staying with Joe. Uh, talked to him, and he said, just yesterday alone, Joe fell twice. Mm -hmm. uh, he gets out of bed when he's not in the room, and uh, just gets up and starts walking around, and, and can't keep her balanced, and falls, so a lot of uh, difficulty there, and Jim is trying to stay very upbeat about it all, staying very positive about it all. Um, he loves his wife. Let me tell you that. He loves that girl. So if you have a chance to be an encouragement to Jim and Joe, go ahead and do that as well. Any other announcements this morning or prayer requests? Brother John? I, I, I want to make a praise, I guess, give a praise uh, on Aubrey. Here is my great granddaughter. Mm -hmm. uh, she has gone home and everything is going well. Good. <coughs> thank everybody for the prayers and I thank everybody for the prayers. All right. Renee? We need to add Howard Mech um, to the prayer list. He's having extensive um, testing on his left leg. Okay. Put Brother Howard on the list. <coughs> <coughs> Wanda? Bowen or Bowen? I want to put my grandson, Brandon Walsh. He's in jail, 20 years old. He's bipolar and obesity. Mm -hmm. But he needs all the prayer we need. Any other things? He hangs out, and that's the problem with him being incarcerated right now. Thelma so, uh, shares with me. For her husband uh, as well as the grandson, so I'm talking about her son as well as the grandson. So um, let's remember uh, that entire family, okay? All right, anyone else? Uh, Jim and uh, Nancy have been real sick all week. That's right. Um, got a text from Nancy yesterday, I guess, uh, that they hoped they were turning the she was turning the corner, but Jim was still <clears throat> um, under the weather, so let's remember them. We were talking a bit this morning about uh, Brother Earl's situation and, and, and Brother Roy's situation and just how fortunate they were to be able to get into the hospital because all the hospitals are full. It's yeah. just difficult to get a bed. <coughs> well, was, uh, I think Earl, when he went, they ended up keeping him uh, kind of in one of the uh, emergency room exam rooms the first night. Brother Roy, they stuck him in a broom closet with a cot and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, a lot of sick things going on around us. So let's remember all of these. Anyone else this morning? Wanda, how about missionary force? We have Larry and Michelle B. Barker and they're in North America.
any of us before we go to prayer this morning? All right, Brother Brad, would you lead us, please? Lord, we just praise you and we thank you once again for being able to come into your house, God. We thank you for your great mercy, your great love that you show us each and every one of us, God, that we come to Jesus Christ. I may we glorify Jesus here today. God, we pray for those in need, God, that you would just give them uh, your special touch, God, that you would just uh, give them comfort and peace, God, in their time of need. Lord, we just uh, pray to be with Brother Danny today as he brings the word, God.
God, we thank you so much for providing for us, God. As we give a small portion back, may you glorify it, God. May we use it for the betterment of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks. 
chapter 1 verse 67 and his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied saying blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets which had been since the world began that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us <coughs> to perform the mercy promise to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant the oath which he swore to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life let's pray together father in heaven we just thank you this morning lord for your word for this uh, precious book that we hold before us lord we Thank you that, uh, that not only does your word speak to us, but the Holy Spirit is here to guide us in this word today, and that he will speak to us as well. We pray that our, our spiritual ears would be open to his, uh, to his word, our, our hearts would be open to his leading. Uh, Father, we, we thank you today for the word made flesh, Jesus Christ himself. And we just pray, Father, as we study in the word that uh, you would keep us mindful that should be an effort to draw closer and closer uh, to the one who came uh, to live among us and die for us. Father, we just thank you for all these things. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you with this um, family here, this body that is before you, and we just pray your blessings on each and every one. Lord, there are many, many things wrong today in our world, uh, completely out of control, uh, Sliding farther and farther away from uh, the way that you would uh, have us live, and, and uh, Lord, we just we just know, though, Lord, that as as uh, great as these problems are, you're even greater today. And Father, we know that uh, today that you're going to take care of us in spite of all of these things. Mm -hmm. Lord, just so much to be thankful for today. Again, we just want to thank you, especially for Jesus, and pray in His name. Amen. Well, we've been uh, looking through this uh, first uh, chapter of the book of Luke, and uh, a couple of three things that we want to remember we've studied as we've looked through here. If you'll turn back to verse uh, 3 and 4 with me, first part of the chapter. Luke, as you remember, is writing unto this Theophilus, 
And he says in 3, he said, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order a most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of these things wherein thou hast been instructed. Now he had mentioned verses 1 and 2 that much of what has uh, come to him has been from first-hand experience, not first-hand experience, but the, the first-hand experience of witnesses that were there uh, and have shared these things with him. But he is putting it down in writing so that this man Theophilus and all others that would come along behind and read these things would uh, be provided with the certainty of these things that he's going to talk about throughout this book. And if you recall, we talked about uh, that phrase that thou mightest know, we, we said means that thou mightest fully recognize the certainty of it. Some of us were talking earlier uh, about uh, people who, who have a knowledge of Christ up here but have no place in their heart for him. Mm -hmm. And what a, what, a, what a terrible tragedy that is. This is what Luke is trying uh, to help people avoid. He says, I, I don't want you to just know the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I want you to know the certainty of these things. I want you to be able to recognize them fully in our lives. And then the second uh, thing that I wanted to point out in this first chapter that we've already covered is over in uh, verse 30. We talked about the certainty of this, these things uh, in our lives, uh, these things that will give us uh, assuredness. But now we're talking about the certainty of God's plan. We talked a bit about it in Sunday school this morning. I was glad to see that. He says in verse 30, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And we looked at some scriptures in Sunday school this morning uh, that prophesied all of this, and now it's going to come true uh, in, in this next chapter as we, as we move forward next week, uh, Lord willing. Uh, we're going to see in this next chapter uh, these things come to fulfillment. This is God's plan, and as we studied this morning, this plan has been in effect since before the foundation of the world. So God has, uh, has uh, set forth all of this, uh, and like Tom said, it's, it's way, way beyond anything I can comprehend, but I'm so thankful, uh, just the same, that God has done it. It's his plan, and we have the certainty of knowing uh, our part in that plan uh, and, and how his plan will affect uh, the future of, of men and women throughout time. Then the third thing I want us to uh, just take a quick peek at is in verse 37 when it says, for with God nothing shall be impossible. So three things we need to remember so far, and there are others as well, three things that, that we want to kind of hang our hats on in this first chapter of Luke so far, is number one, the certainty of these things. So when we read these things, Luke is telling us, listen, uh, I, I talked to the people who were there, and maybe he talked to Mary and Joseph themselves, but we don't know who he talked to. But I talked to people who were there, I talked to people who know. And much of what he, he tells us about in the coming chapters uh, uh, can almost, uh, we, can, we can go back in, in, in history and see the names and the places and, and realize that these were real events that took place. So we have the certainty of all of these things, that it, that it is the Word of God, it is the truth of God, uh, it has a place in our lives if we will let it, and that place in our lives is to give us this full understanding, this full recognition of God at work in the world today, God at work in our lives today, and that he has been at work according to his great plan since before the foundation of the world and will continue on until he calls all of this to a close and calls his children home. And he is able to do all of that and to take care of us through all of that because of his great power with God. All things are possible, or as Luke says it, for with God nothing shall be impossible. So these are the things that we've, we've looked at so far in the book of Luke. These are the things we need to continue to think on as we go forward from here. We have, we have seen now the birth of John the Baptist. We've seen it foretold. Uh, we've seen, we know the story of the angel visiting with Zechariah. We know the promise that uh, the angel told him was about to be fulfilled, that a son would be born. And that meant a son not only to Zechariah and Elizabeth, but also the Son of God, the Messiah. Uh, is about to appear. 
uh, in the world. Yes, and did. we've seen the angel go to Mary and, 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 and lay out the plan for her and before her and let her know exactly what's going to take place. We see Mary come to Elizabeth and the two worship together and praise God together for a period of months. We've seen the birth of John now uh, last Sunday evening as, as Elizabeth comes full term and gives birth to this son. And now, if you recall, Zechariah uh, had some doubt in his heart when the angel told him all these things that were going to happen. And because of that, he said, okay, you want a sign? I'll give you a sign. You're going to be mute from this day forth until the son is born and you name him John. And sure enough, when the son was born and, and uh, the they, uh, father said, no, his name is wrote out, no, his name is going to be John, uh, immediately uh, his speech was restored and he began to speak. It tells us in verse 64, begins to speak and praise God. What we read just this morning in 67 through 70 is part of that praise time that Zechariah is having. And this is in the midst of those who have come together uh, to, to celebrate on the birth of this child. We don't know how many that is, but there are others uh, within earshot of all of this. And Zechariah begins to praise God, but he also begins to prophesy, it tells us. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, now, being filled with the Holy Ghost, if you remember, this isn't this isn't uh, this this is still prior to the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has not come uh, to remain, but God will send His Holy Holy Ghost uh, from time to time into the lives of people uh, for a certain certain purpose for a certain event to take place, and that's what's happening here. He sent the Holy Spirit. He has filled Zechariah with the Holy Spirit. And Zechariah begins to prophesy. Now, the prophecy doesn't come through from Zechariah. It comes through Zechariah. The prophecy is coming through the Holy Spirit that is in him. This is God sent himself. So these are the words of God that he, is, that he is speaking now. And he says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. So the first thing we see that uh, Zechariah begins to praise God for and to prophesy through the Holy Spirit about is God's faithfulness. We need to understand this morning that God is faithful. Um, Brother Tom uh, closed uh, this morning in our Sunday school class uh, with some questions to consider for next week. Uh, but one of the, uh, just go ahead and give you a spoiler alert. The answer to one of those questions is because of God's faithfulness. And we can, we can, we can put uh, lock, stock, and barrel in that truth, that God is always faithful. You and I may falter, you and I may fail, you and I may stumble, you and I may do uh, things that, uh, that uh, we, we really wish we hadn't done, but God will always be faithful. And it's his faithfulness, not our faithfulness, that keeps the plan in motion. It's his faithfulness, not our faithfulness, that gives us this certainty. It's his faithfulness, not our faithfulness, that causes the power of God to work in our lives. It's nothing that we do or earn or merit it's simply because of God's faithfulness in fulfilling the promises that he's made. If you look in verse 70 there, that's exactly what he says. All of these things, Zechariah says, that are happening right now were prophesied by God's holy prophets from the beginning, he said, uh, which have been since the world began. So these prophecies have been going on. Uh, in Sunday school this morning, uh, we read in... in, in uh, uh, where was it, Tom? Chapter 3, the first prophecy of, of uh, the coming of Messiah. And so we've, we've seen this. Uh, uh, Zechariah is saying, we've seen this, we've heard this, we know that it was promised to us, and now in our own sight and within our own, uh, the sound of my voice, these things are coming true, and that's because God is faithful. He makes a promise, he will, he will be faithful to that promise. So folks, Listen to me now this morning. It's hard, easy as it is to say and hard to do, I know. I, I know it is. But still, we must find, we must, we must take comfort and solace in knowing that God promised it, it will take place. Amen. When he said, let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house are many mansions. He meant that. And, and we can take comfort in that. We can find peace in that and solace in that. When Jesus said, I will never leave you comfortless, I will come to you, we can believe that because he would never say it if it wasn't true. When God told his people in the Old Testament and 
uh, we're reminded of it in the news, that I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. We can take hold of that and hang on to it in the toughest of times. I, I, can't, I can't begin, and, and, and we all have our problems. You, we understand that. <clears throat> we all have our difficulties in life. And I'm not saying one is any greater than another or one any, any less than another. I'm just using Jim and Joe as an example. I don't know how in the world Jim can go through that day after day after day except, and he, and he confesses this himself, because of Jesus Christ. Because he has taken those promises, he has grabbed hold of them, he's not going to let them go. They are, they are promises of God. God is faithful, so it is true. And he, and he bases his life, he bases everything about what's going on in his life on those truths today. Mm -hmm. and I know, I know. Easy to say, hard to do. I tell my patients when I go out and visit, I tell them every day, every day we talk about, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Every day we talk about <clears throat> how we ought to trust in God with all our hearts. Every day we, we, we talk about Jesus' promise, I'll never leave you, I, I, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Every day we talk about these things, and when we get through talking about them, every day I say to them, but you know what, that's just easy to say and hard to do, isn't it? That's the truth. It is. It, it is hard to do. Uh, the, the, the promises of God don't make it any easier to live out this life. The promises of God are what give us the, the, the comfort, the, the, the hope, and the peace that we need to live out this life. It doesn't take away the hardship. It doesn't take away the tribulation. It doesn't take away the trials and the troubles. All of those are still going to come uh, on the on the un, on the on the evil and the and the good too. They're still going to come on the unsaved and the saved as well. But the saved have these promises that we hang on to. The saved know that God is faithful, and so the saved find comfort and hope and peace in the midst of all these troubles that come through God Himself. Zechariah prophesies that God is faithful. He's faithful to fulfill His promises. Look what he says in verse uh, 68, the first part there. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He is faithful. He is faithful to visit and to redeem his people. Now that word visit and that phrase comes in, a, in another place in, in our Bible. If you, if you want to turn with me to chapter 3 of uh, Exodus, verse 16. It's amazing to me how many chapter 3's and verse 16's um, bring us to the same <coughs> in the But Exodus chapter 3, verse 16. God is speaking to Moses, and he says, Go and gather the elders of Israel together, and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. What was God saying to them? God was telling them, you know, you think I have not noticed any of this that's going on. You may think that I have abandoned you. That I, You may think that I'm a far off God and, and that one day I'll fulfill all those promises in a spiritual sense when you step into the, into the, to the eternal heavenlies. But I'm telling you, I visit you on a regular basis. I am with you through it all. I know what you are going through. I see it and I feel it. He knows, he sees, and he understands our need is what he's saying. He told the children of Israel, I have, I have visited you. I have seen what is done to you. He tells uh, through Zechariah back in chapter 1 of Luke, he says uh, that, that uh, the Lord God is blessed because, or to be praised because, he has visited and redeemed his people because he has seen and he has known our need. And God sees and knows each and every need of each and every person seated here today. And all of those who couldn't be here today. He knows our needs. He sees those needs. And he is faithful to meet those needs through his promises of Jesus Christ. I, uh, Zechariah is saying God is faithful. Faithful to fulfill his promise. Faithful to visit his people, to see and to know our need. And then faithful also, again in verse 68, to redeem his people. And uh, in verse 69 as well, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. So he has, not only has he seen and known our need, but he has, pro he has provided a way 
for that need to be met. And notice what he says about this horn of salvation that he's going to raise up. <coughs> says he is going to raise uh, he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David and this this savior will be greater than any other that has ever come there will never be one to come close to what this savior is now they have had saviors before in a, in an earthly sense okay uh, Gideon was one of their saviors he came and and uh, and the Lord used him to free his people from their oppressors Moses was a savior in the sense that the Lord used him to go and to free his people from their oppressors. And this has happened over and over and over through the history of Israel. But he's saying to them now, there'll never be a greater one than this. I have provided a way of salvation to you. I have provided a way to redeem you, not just from your enemies, but from your spiritual enemy of sin as well. And I have put it all into place before, because of you. You can take, you can believe that with all certainty. It is my plan for you and for all of mankind, and I have the power which makes nothing impossible for me to do. Zechariah says God is faithful. The second thing that God, Zechariah wants us to know is that God is merciful. Look at verse 71. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies. So he, he talks about the fact that not only is God faithful, but God is merciful. Number one, he says, he in verse 72 and 73, he says he is merciful to remember and to fulfill his covenant. Now he made a covenant with Abraham a long time ago. Again, if you want to go back with me, we're going to look in Genesis chapter 12. We looked at that in Sunday school this morning, so... Turn with me only if you want to. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, and to a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. How in the world are all the families of the earth going to be blessed? Well, let's, let's look at another one real quick like before we answer that. Chapter 22 of Genesis. Chapter 22, and we're going to look at verse 15 through 18. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of, the he out of heaven the second time, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. How in the world is this one man going to be able to be a blessing to all the people that will ever live during that time or since that time? And that is because the seed that he's talking about is Jesus Christ himself. And when that Savior is provided for all of mankind, then all of man will be blessed by Abraham's seed. Back in chapter 1 of Luke, he says... He is faithful to remember and to fulfill his covenant. And basically, it all comes down in a nutshell. His, his covenant with man has always been, I will provide a way. I will pro provide a Savior. And that Savior is going to save them from their enemies. Look again in verse 71. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. And then in verse 74. That he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies... Now, he was talking about the enemies of all those around him. The nation of Israel had plenty of enemies. Everybody hated Israel then. Everybody hates Israel today. Mm -hmm. yep. they, 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 they hate them with a, with a, with a passion. <coughs> and they hate them not even understanding why they hate them sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, and we see that even in our country now, that's beginning to swing. Mm -hmm. uh, where this country has always been a faithful friend and ally to the nation of Israel, it, we're beginning to turn away from them politically and in many other ways as well, uh, turn away from the Jews. Uh, we're seeing this take place in our, in our midst today. 
But he's talking more than just about physical enemies. The nation of, of the United States, our country, has many enemies throughout the world. Uh, you and I may have enemies uh, in, our, in, our own, in our own neighborhoods. Who knows uh, that we may have enemies, those that hate us for who we are. But, but he's talking about a different kind of enemy, uh, more than these that are, that are physically our enemies. He's talking about spiritual enemies. And those, those spiritual enemies come down to three. He's talking about he's going to save us from our enemies, he says in verse 71. Uh, and that enemy is Satan. He's going to save us from Satan. He's going to save us from death. And he's going to save us from sin. Now, how is he going to do that? He's going to save us from Satan because we're going to be protected. Folks, you and I need to understand today that Satan is that roaring lion. He is still going about seeking whom he may devour. He is still uh, out to hurt all of those that, that God loves so dearly. But understand this. Satan can only do so much in our lives, and all he can do in our lives is really what we allow him to do in our lives. Again, the Sunday school lesson this morning pointed that out with Eve. It wasn't Satan who, who, who sinned against God. It was, it was Adam and Eve for the choice that they made uh, to do what they did. Now, Satan was there to entice them. <laughs> Satan was there to allure them. Satan was there to try and lead them away if at all possible, and he is here in that sense today. But understand this, if we are if we're saved by the blood of Christ, if we're putting on that armor daily, if we're walking in the ways that Jesus walked, walk in the light as he is in the light, then <laughs> Satan has no authority over any one of us. Amen. None whatsoever. Amen. We are protected from Satan. So really, Satan's already a defeated enemy. Amen. It's just a matter of time when it, when it actually uh, takes place. But he's already a defeated enemy. The second thing, the second enemy that he's talking about is death, and we are delivered from death. Because the only death the Christian will ever face is the death uh, in the flesh here. If, if Jesus tarries long enough, we will see death in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Some of us may not. Jesus may come back before that time. And the scriptures <laughs> tell us that the dead in Christ will rise, and then those that remain, those who are still alive, will be, will be taken out as well. So, so the only death here that he's talking about is, is the death of the flesh, uh, it, the spiritual death we've been delivered from. When we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and we were redeemed of our sins and cleansed from the blood of Christ and, and become uh, that child of God that God has intended us, uh, for us to be all along, then we are delivered from any death that would come about because uh, of, of death being an enemy. The real enemy, though, the real enemy, the one that we need to be in constant combat with each and every day is this enemy of sin. Now, we are redeemed. We are redeemed. We no longer are, are, are uh, we no longer uh, seen with the sins that were on us before we accepted Jesus Christ. God doesn't see those. The scriptures tell us that he has taken them and he's cast them into a sea of forgetfulness. Uh, do we still sin today? We have a sinful nature. And that's the battle that goes on each and every day. That, that, that battle over the sinful nature. This, this natural man is going to continue to sin, but this spiritual man, this spiritual man has been redeemed. And, and he has not only been redeemed from the sins he's committed, but he has been redeemed from his spiritual nature. No longer do we cling to that nature. No longer do we revel in that nature. No longer do we find joy in that nature. Instead, because of Jesus Christ, because of his redeeming sacrifice now, uh, we, we hate that nature. Uh, we do, we do uh, all that we can uh, to, to, to put that nature at arm's length. Uh, we struggle with it still, but, but it's, it's, it's a matter of hating what we do now. Whereas before, uh, we, we, we took it to our hearts and, and really reveled in it. So he says, God is faithful, God is merciful to deliver us from our enemy. Now God, he, he's telling us here in these prophecies, as he's prophesying, he's telling us things that, that uh, they knew then, uh, that they would be reminded of still when the, when, the, when the prophecy of Jesus Christ is fulfilled. And he's telling us of things that we know today, but we need to be reminded of. God is faithful. We need to, we need to take our comfort and, and solace in that. And God is merciful. And we need to hang our hats on that today, that, that uh, he is going to see us through all this through his great mercy. But the last thing that, it, that he wants us to know this morning, the last thing we're going to talk about is not quite as... Uh, as, uh, doesn't sound quite as encouraging as the first thing, because what he's telling us in these last verses 
is that not only is God faithful, not only is God merciful, but God is demanding as well. I sat last night and, uh, as I was putting this down on paper, and I tried to come up with a little softer word than demanding, and I never could because that's what it means. God is very demanding. God, God demands certain things from his people. And he, he, he feels, and he should feel, he has the right to feel, because he is God, that if he is faithful, if he is merciful, then you and I should, uh, should understand that we have responsibilities to God as well. And he is demanding about those responsibilities. Let's look at them in verse 74, the last part, in verse 75. Let's read all of 74. That he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might, number one, serve him without fear. So God is demanding of our service today, folks. It's not an option for us to decide how or when we're going to serve God. Right. It never was laid out before. So listen now, Daddy, I, 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 I sent my son, my one and only son, into the world so that he, he would die for your sins and you could be saved and, and live forevermore. And by the way, if you'd like to get involved a little more than that, here's what I want you to do. If, you know, if you feel like you can handle this, I'd like you to take part in it. That's not what he says at all. He demands our service, folks. And he is, he is worthy of our service. And this service he talks about is a service without fear. Uh, you know, not only without fear of, of what, what man may do to us, but even more so without fear of God himself. <coughs> he wants us to serve him not as a slave who fears his master, not as a prisoner who might fear the jailer. He wants us to serve him as a child who serves out of love and respect for his parents. When we were out at the Indian school for uh, 10 years, uh, you know, there was a whole range of, in the Indian, in Indian community, Indian culture of people. There were Christians, there were people who, who didn't care one way or the other, and then there were people who were still sold out uh, to the old ways and the old beliefs. And the old ways and the old beliefs had a, had a spiritual uh, realm as well, and there, there was a system of how to deal with these spirits, and, and you were always dealing with the spirits out of fear. You weren't dealing with them because you loved them. You were dealing with them so that they wouldn't be angry with you. God says, I want you to serve me, but I don't want you to serve me because you're afraid I'll be angry with you otherwise. I want you to serve me because you love me. I want you to serve me because you respect me. I want you to serve me because I'm worthy to be served. I want you to serve out of a, a heart of joy. I, I think about I think about trying to put this in, into a, to an illustration. Uh, you know, I, I, I love football. And so if I'm sitting and I'm watching Alabama football on the TV and, and, and one of my grandchildren or one of my children or, or my wife come in the room and they have a need, uh, then, then what do I do? Do I continue to watch the game or do I, do I put the game aside and, and go and take care of that need, right? That's what I do. Thank you very much. <laughs> you put the TV on hold. <laughs> Praise God for DVR. <laughs> but that's what we should do. The, 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 the needs of, 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 of those that, that we love are the needs that, that should have priority in our life. And, and this is the same, same sort of thing. God should have a priority in our lives, not because we fear him, not because we're afraid of him, not because we, we don't want to make him angry. He should have the priority in our lives because we love him that much, that we're willing to put all things aside. He says, he says God is demanding of our service, and we serve without fear. And then we also serve, in verse 75, with holiness and righteousness before him. And that word holiness there means that inward conforming, inwardly conforming to the mind of Christ. In other words, we, we, we seek the mind of Christ in all things. Uh, you know, we seek the mind of Christ, I think, in, in, in a lot of petty ways, okay? And, and I, don't, I don't think that God's not interested in that kind of thing, too. God is as interested in what might seem trivial as, as he is in what might seem uh, uh, vitally important. So, but, but you and I have a, have a, we have a tendency to, to, to find the mind of Christ on things that we've kind of already made up our mind about anyway, okay? Because then we can carry it forward from there uh, without any real, without any real uh, commitment on our part. But we are to seek the mind of Christ in all things. 
We are to seek the mind of Christ in the trivial. We are to seek the mind of Christ in the, in the things that are of vital importance. We're to seek the mind of Christ in the minor issues of life. We're to seek the mind of Christ in the major issues of life. We are always seeking the mind of Christ because we want to become more and more like him as each and every day goes on. All right? That is our service. That's the, the, the thing that God demands in our service. And this, this, uh, this righteousness he's talking about is the outwardly conforming to the doctrines of the gospel. <coughs> Living our lives out in a, in, a, in a sense of righteousness according to what the doctrines of the gospel tell us. Uh, you know, we... Well, let's move on. Verse 75, then. Or 75, the last part. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. God is a 24-7 God. And he expects our service 24-7. Yeah. Now, you and I may say, well, that's just not possible. Uh, that's, that's one of those things that, uh, that is, is good to listen to, but it's just not possible. We used to have a man uh, years and years and years ago who always said, you know, some people are so... Uh, so spiritually, how do you put it? So spiritually minded that they're no earthly good. That's just not true, folks. We are to be spiritually minded in all things so that we can be earthly good to those around us. If we are seeking the mind of Christ, if we are spiritually minded that, that we want to do all things according to the mind of Christ, then that is going to be lived out in our lives. We're still going to go to work. We're still going to. We're still going to uh, have family time. We're still going to have uh, um, uh, recreational time. We're still going to do all the things that we do now. But we're going to do them in the mind of Christ. It's that mind of Christ that is going to help us apply the doctrines of the gospel to our everyday living and carry them out. And remember, the mind of Christ is something that's going on inside us. The 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 righteousness. <laughs> Uh, that we're talking about is an outward expression of what's going on inside us. And so those around us will see it and, and understand it. So he goes on, he says, God is faithful, number one. God is merciful, number two. And God is demanding, number three. And he's demanding all the days of our lives, 24 hours uh, a day, seven days a week. He is demanding of all these things. And he, he demands these things because... Of his great power? No. Because of his great might? No. Because of his great holiness? No. He demands all of these things because of his love. Because of his love for us that he proves to us through his faithfulness and his mercy. And because of our love for him which we are to prove to him through worship and adoration or worship and praise by, by living out uh, the things of Christ in our lives today. He says to us, uh, Zechariah is prophesying here. And he is prophesying uh, at this point uh, not about the son that is yet to come. We're going to see the prophecies about him uh, this evening as Jesus tarries. But he's prophesying now about what God has done among his people and what God is doing among his people. God is faithful. God is merciful. God is demanding. You and I need to understand that. We, we take advantage of his faithfulness. We take advantage of his mercy. We've got to be willing to meet uh, the demands that he puts before us to live before him in a way that is pleasing and honoring to him. I know our time is gone, so let's stand together. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are so thankful today, Lord, that... Uh, that you do love us as you do. Love us as much as you love anybody in this world. And because of that love, Father, you are, you are, you are faithful uh, to all of yours. You're faithful, you're merciful, and yet, Lord, it's that, that same love that brings us faithfulness and mercy also, also presents to us the demands uh, that you place on our lives. And the demands are that we are to serve you. We are to serve you with a heart of love, with a heart of devotion. Father, we're to serve you uh, with the mind of Christ. We are to serve you by living out, living out, not just agreeing with them, but living out the doctrines that we see in the gospel of Jesus Christ, showing to a lost world around us that, that, that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is still uh, changing the hearts and lives of men and women throughout the world, that Jesus is the only real hope and comfort that we could possibly uh, have in, this, in these days troubles and times. Lord, we pray today that you would help us to live in this way. Lord, we thank you again for Jesus and we pray in his name.
We slept a lot yesterday. I woke up at one, one something last night. I did too. I really? I laid there in bed. How old are you now? I ain't had a lot to do with the weather. Yeah. I'm 75 old. 